remembered what it was I wanted to say before. I, I, I thought I wanted to bring to attention that our speakers today, both of them did their presentations in way under 20 minutes. They did them 15 to 18 minutes. Give them a round of applause. And I thought the quality uh, of the, uh, of the um, presentations was also quite excellent. So at this point, I'm sure you all have your own things you want to express, and I'll ask you to uh, come up and line up right over here, and we'll call both speakers back to the lectern. And I'm going to start off with the first question. Uh, my question is, uh, Brother Sam, you said in the beginning that the question was awkwardly worded. Please tell me how uh, we could have worded it better. Thank you. Well, I, I, I don't know about wording it better or... Um, come up to the podium, please. Uh, maybe... Uh, don't have a debate? Huh? Don't have a debate? Uh, maybe on, on this subject, okay. not so much. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just... It's, it's about the context. To me, the context is, you know, uh, revolutionary change in the society, right, today. And, and, and I, don't, I don't have an answer for you on that. I have to think it through. Maybe, maybe right. Brother Sorrell has it, or maybe some of the audience has it. You know, I, Step I up have... to the podium so I can see the both of you. Okay. Oh. Well, you too. <laughs> he said both. <laughs> Legs. I think that there needs to be another leg on this table. Um, the mindset created from being in the military is much more uh, far-reaching than either of these two gentlemen have indicated. Nevertheless, they did do a good job. If we look at some of the significant movements, especially after 1801, men of the military have been in the forefront. Okay, right now uh, I have a list of men, black men who were buried in the Brooklyn Navy Yard as a result of which this information was gotten by Sun Carson whose uh, uh, ancestor had served in the, the Mexican War and ultimately he was transported <coughs> to Ghana to create the Door of Return. Uh, Samuel Carson, uh, Sonny Carson, his ancestor, yeah. uh, did that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the blacks served in, in the French War, but if we look at when Du Bois called the First Pan-African Congress in 1919, the ace in the hall he had was Blaise Dion, which was a West African who had recruited more than 100,000 West Africans to fight for, for, for um, for France. And as a result of that Fourth Pan African Congress, this the philosophy is still alive today. Uh, there have been a number of other issues. Uh, um, um, Harry Belafonte speaks about the the most decorated Vietnam um, World War II veteran who was a black guy wearing his uniform in uh, on a bus in the South and he was pulled from the bus in this segregated uh, situation, and he was practically murdered right there. And uh, Belafonte said that that made him an activist. So my point is that, uh, uh, look, we got to have people everywhere, because we can't let these people, if you're saying that the skinheads are there, and they're learning how to prepare for us, we got to have our people in there, right. learning what the skinheads are doing, learning the skills. Uh, right. uh, uh, my son-in-law is from, uh, um, um, a place in Georgia, I can't remember. Uh, the Haitians who came to fight the Battle of Savannah, when I told him about it, he's from Savannah, when I told him, he's a member of the military, I told him about the Battle of Savannah. Um, uh, um, uh. Brother Fred, Brother Fred, I'm not going to stop you. No, but, 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 Fred, but, hold, hold, hold. <laughs> Listen, all right. We want the questions to be shorter and the statements to be shorter. I just want you to wrap, wrap, you know, just finish in two sentences and then let the brothers uh, respond. Can you say that there was something in terms of the, 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 um, um, the security or, or the, the, the freedom of black people that being in the military has helped in any way to bring towards moving us closer to being free? Let me, brother and sisters, this is uh, historian, Brother Fred Monison. Give him a round of applause. Uh, but I'm going to ask the other questioners. 
to please keep your question. I'd like you to keep it under one minute. If you don't keep it under two minutes, I'm going to have to stand up because otherwise everybody won't be able to get a, a question in before we have to close up, okay? All right. Thank you, Brother Fred. Uh, <clears throat> I, I say yes. I, I say yes at one time. Um, the contributions uh, of black people through the military did provide us with um, positive use within our struggle to be free. It, but today, 2015, that is not the case. Do you want to just question the you know, same answer? Next. Uh, Dr. Anderson, one thing that Step out into the center, please, so we can see. You. Uh, Dr. Anderson, one thing that you said struck me, and it, it, you said there was a lack today of an organiz of a sophisticated organization. You know, I was thinking about the Montgomery boycott. Do you think there is an organization that could get uh, people to, say, boycott the New York City bus system, or do anything of the scale of the Montgomery bus boycott today? And if so, what organization would that be? a new organization that you and I and others in this room put together. It's the only way. Yeah. 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 Sort of on the same line with the last question, um, Barbara Sam Anderson, in your <laughs> summation as you talked about us having uh, being further away from having the kind of organization with the level of sophistication necessary to be able to make usage of the enemy's apparatus toward you know, mm -hmm. our purpose, as well as do a whole bunch of other things that need to be done. That we're further away from that um, from the late 60s and 70s, being that you have been an uh, iconic leader within this period, um, what do we need to do differently um, in that what we were doing has been moving us further away? What, what needs to be different? <laughs> That's another, another discussion, yes. Uh, I, I think I think for some of us, we have to go back to um, looking at what we did, what the positive things that we did during that period in terms of organizing, uh, study, um, and, and making international connections and so forth, building up um, our, our, our connections in, in within the Pan-African uh, realm. Um, I, I think we also need to, in that, engage young people, young brothers and sisters, not as young brothers and sisters, but as revolutionaries, you know, developing revolutionaries within, within the various um, organizations. Not just one organization necessarily, but many different kinds of organizations that deal with the issues of housing, jobs, education, health, and so forth, but with a, with, with, with with um, an understanding that you cannot develop a revolutionary organization or revolutionary consciousness by being a 501c3 organization, mm -hmm. by being dependent on you know, the Gates Foundation or Ford or something like that. It mm -hmm. has to come from the community. I think the, the power of SNCC and SCLC was that initially their monies came from the people that they were organizing. And we don't have that today. That's one of our starting points that we need, that we need to go back to. And it's, it's um, uh, I believe, a much more uh, complicated situation today uh, because one of, many situa one of many things is that our young people have been deeply dumbed down. And, and to the point where um, they don't uh, they don't want to study. They want if like um, like uh, if they move from um, Black Lives Matter Ferguson now uh, to something else, 
it's going to be a spontaneous move. We have to intervene and say, no, let's not jump from one issue to another, that there are certain things that you can build upon within this Black Lives Matter movement that, that requires study as well as struggle. I think that's a, an important component that we had uh, 40, 50 years ago that we don't have now. And, and, and there are maybe others as, as, as we talk on on this matter. Yeah, I would, I would add to that that a lot of information that we knew about in the 19th century, we've forgotten mm. in terms of ideologies, philosophies, that uh, we don't study history and we don't learn from history. Uh, you mentioned Montgomery bus boycott and other civil rights activities were very well organized. And we don't organize today. Every year we have Black Solidarity Day, and you hear about the day before Black Solidarity Day. You only hear about Black Solidarity Day, you know, 11, 12 months before, preparation for that day. And so then things don't happen the way people want them to happen. So my answer is, if you study history, look at those who spoke before, and we have, we have a long list of, of, of doers, and they had ideologies, and today they're just names. We don't know their we don't know their platforms. We don't know their programs. And so, as a consequence, we're still in this this plane, this, this level here. Uh, it's 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 quixotic and it's half sided. So we don't necessarily need to go across seas uh, to do that and go and fight uh, and engage in other wars abroad so much as we need to know who we are here and what needs to be done. Uh, another issue I'd like to bring up with that, that goes into that, is that uh, that was about maybe two, four or five months ago when the nine-year-old girl, a white girl, uh, fatally shot one of the uh, firearm instructors at some uh, gun range. Mm -hmm. And that was just one incident. Had that not happened, you would have never known that the small nine-year-old mm -hmm. was at a gun range being taught. And that's just one out of hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands, maybe millions. Right. So, you know, our children aren't doing that. We really don't have anything that's Afrocentrically based with reference to, uh, say, a Girl Scout, Boy Scout kind of thing. We learn just just simple of things on survival, things like that. Uh, just this was just last month or two months ago now. This is uh, January eighth, the fourteenth. This is Gun for Hire. This is at uh, you know Woodland uh, Park Range, uh, somewhere in New Jersey there. But you know, with this particular uh, article or ad here, it's free uh, gun rental. I uh, went on the website for that. So, you know, and all on the websites uh, features there, young or small, white kids, lots of uh, whites, no, no, no blacks. And if they are, they probably are, uh, you know, uh, inculcated uh, uh, half backwards with the projective and approach towards what they need to do. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. See where you're coming from. But, again, that's a little quixotic. I'd like to, you know, first thank the speakers. You know, step for out. Providing Would you step out, please? I'd like to thank the speakers for providing some unique insight um, into this discussion because I've had this discussion, you know, multiple times, and there's a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, it appears that the discussion focuses around the evolution of the black soldier. You know, when we start talking about from the 1700s to now, and the evolution of that consciousness and their level of dependency on the dominant society. So um, as revolutionary organizations, what do you think of, you know, because we've always talked about the bridge between the elders and the youth, and we have a lot of, um, you know, black veterans. So what can we do to actually point out and identify those, those um, black veterans and engage our youth in extracting from them some of the knowledge that they have um, that can at least prepare them if they decide to go into the military. And, um, and even if they don't decide to go into the military, just harnessing that knowledge and wisdom that they have with respect to being a military, be, be, being a military man and, um, you know, in, in that type of facet. I gave you a couple of suggestions. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Black Fest for Social Justice in Brooklyn. And, uh, a lot of them are Vietnam vets, some are more recent vets, but they, they deal with all the issues that they are confronted with, whether it's housing or employment or you know, medical health issues. 
Uh, also, too, you know, I mean, again, you can have conversations, but also to read, there's a very uh, good book about Vietnam called Bloods by Wallace Terry, mm -hmm. where he interviewed a number of, of soldiers who enlisted and also some who were officers. And they, they ranged from very patriotic to, hell, no, I don't want to go, but I have to. Mm -hmm. And he interviewed them. And so you get a perspective of what it's like uh, for those who were in the military and how they were either treated fairly or certainly mistreated in most cases. Uh, it's not a problem inviting people. I mean, you have schools, you have after-school programs, you have veteran organizations like Black Vest or Social Justice to invite people, to invite them to talk to the young people. And as Brother Anderson said, some of these vests might say, hell no, don't, because I, I did, and now I can tell you why you shouldn't. Uh, to myself, I'm old enough. I, I have four military deferments because I grew up in a time when they had military draft. I had one in 1959-63 to go to undergraduate college. I had from 63 to 65 to go to Africa in the Peace Corps. I had I had a, a half deferment from 1965 until I got a draft notice in the spring of 1966, and I was told to go downtown. To Whitehall Station, take a physical, and then the bottom of the page it said, disregard above, take the physical, and it gave me a deferment until February 1967, because I was my master's then. So I got a job teaching in September of 66, and I had another deferment. And then in September, October 67, I went to Vietnam to teach in a Vietnamese high school, and I got a deferment. I got deferment to go to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in Vietnam and I got caught up in what they call the Tet Offensive that occurred on January the 31st, 1968, in which every city, including the one I lived in and worked in, was uh, attacked by North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. And so I couldn't teach because my school was all full of refugees. And so I worked in a civilian hospital with American Air Force doctors and nurses for about six weeks. And I worked in the operating room. And I saw everything from brain surgery to amputations. And I vowed I already got drafted, I was going to go to jail. <laughs> when I came back, I was 27 years old. And I didn't realize until many years later that they didn't want anyone my age. Because I was too damn smart to want to go in the military. Because then, see, when you're 18, you go in the military because you think it's a football game. <laughs> you think you get tackled like in football and you get up. I saw, I saw in Vietnam, I heard an explosion, this right during the Tet invasion, I heard an explosion, and I walked about four blocks, and I saw military people, and I saw what looked like a chicken fat and a wire fence, mm -hmm. and I saw a yellow foot inside of a boot, and that was all I saw, because it was like a direct hit. And I saw people, you know, gang green because they stepped on mines and so forth, so I learned a lot about what war does to people. So that, that kind of convinced me that war was not the answer, but that's another story. <laughs> In that same period, I learned about the racist hypocrisy of the United States. I was teaching at Queens College and, um, in 1968. 68, 68. 68. Uh, I'm therefore exempt from, from uh, the draft uh, because I was teaching mathematics. And they are exempt from the draft. Yet, uh, that, that October, the FBI arrests me for draft evasion. That's right. <laughs> and on top of that, disinformation that I was not only uh, evading the draft, but I was, I was the link between the Black Panther Party and the communist world. You know, it was, all, it, it was, it was crazy. And so, I, you know, my, my whole... What little reputation I had was, was, was shot, you know, in terms of academia and what have you. Um, so, you know, on his experience is one side, and then, the, um, uh, and then in between us, there are thousands of brothers who, who had other kinds of horrendous experiences in terms of uh, that, the being in that limbo component in, in the military, uh, I mean, in, 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 in the United States between the military and jail, right? Um, and, and I think that, um, again, when, when we talk about the U.S. military 2015, we're talking about 
an imperial army. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking about a U.S. military in 2015 being used here in the United States. Don't forget the Patriot, the Patriot Act. Okay? That allows the military to be used, and it's being used here in the United States. We saw it th through proxy. We saw that in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And they had to pull that back. Yeah. All that military freely given to the, to the police uh, forces in the United States had to be given back. So that when we're talking about our young people going into the military now, it's not the military of the 1940s or the 60s or the 2000s, early 2000s. It is, a mili it is a formidable imperial military that will use its own forces on its own people. And we are too weak at this point as a people in terms of a political movement to uh, allow our brothers and sisters to go in. So it's, 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 a, it's a real struggle, most likely on a one-to-one -one basis when you leave here and you know somebody who's thinking about being in the military to encourage them not to go. Many of the things that I was going to say, you say and say very well. And say it very well. I think that uh, one thing I want to contribute is that we need to zero in on the young people we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What's their reality? It's a school to prison pipeline right. with public education in, 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 in grave <coughs> danger of being systematically destroyed and a whole generation going down the tubes. The question is will the military in any way solve that problem for that group of black folks as a group? And I would suggest no. no. I would reinforce what you say by pointing to the fact that the specific changes that we're talking about are that we no longer have even the pretense of a citizen army, right, based on the draft. This is an all-volunteer military, right, mm -hmm. designed to implement a high-tech form of warfare with extreme centralization of command and control. In addition, these people know what we've attempted to do previously in the military, right? And they've designed countermeasures mm -hmm. and ways to take those people who go in and make them fight against their own people. Mm -hmm. And lastly, there's a blurring of the distinction to reinforce, this is the last point I would make, to reinforce that there's a blurring of distinctions between the traditional military role of the military and its contemporary role. The police have been militarized. Posse comitatus has gone by the wayside so that we have Marines drilling in Oakland, right? Because it's uh, 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 felt that the military will have to be used in domestic situations of, of potential insurrection. So given all that, our kids should stay light years away from the military. And we should be organizing here in our communities to meet the inevitable attacks which will come from militarized police and regular military units. Uh, are you all going to respond to anything that you think needs to be responded to that the brother said? Well, explain posse comitatus. Because, I mean, not everybody knows what that is. Uh, posse comitatus. Posse comitatus is just some Latin that basically says that the military can't come into your house, record it in, 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 in your home, you know, do domestic police functions in the streets. That is basically defending the country from foreign, foreign. Right. enemies. Although there's, you know, no caveat in the Constitution for all enemies, foreign and domestic. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, that's a contradiction. On one hand, they say you can't do that. But on the other hand, they're making a constitutional requirement. They better be looking at each way. Well, right? To defend the country and, and to oppose all enemies, one of the not Who's the not kidding? Us. <laughs> <laughs> um, peace. I, uh, I enjoyed the <coughs> presentation today as I enjoyed the presentation on my first visit to Clark House. Uh, and uh, some points that I have from uh, Brother William. Uh, your position on the joining the military, the pro side. 
uh, that uh, I want to ask you. You stated that African men who joined the military uh, became disciplined, that the military was a way of instilling discipline in, the, in soldiers. Uh, uh, and also you stated how that men, Africans, when they, in, in the early eight, uh, stages of uh, Africans being uh, put into the U.S. military, you spoke of the Civil War era and such as that, that one of the psychological advantages there was that these Africans lost the fear of the omnipotent white man and realized that they could kill white people and not necessarily be killed themselves. Uh, and another point you made that I want to ask, uh, have, have responded to, uh, is the point. Oh yes, that okay. Dealing with the first thing about uh, about uh, discipline. Uh, do you not think that Africans were disciplined as enslaved African with an ironclad devotion to family and friends in in the, in the times of of the most vicious uh, periods of their life being enslaved and treated as chattel. And uh, do you not think that Africans uh, knew and had the absence of fear of the white man from the, uh, from the encroachment of, sla of slavers in the shores of Africa on the Middle Passage with all these uh, numerous rebellions that they had in, they had within them the psychological courage and and insight that this white man is not infallible. We can kill them. We can liberate ourselves from them, and and that we didn't have to join the white man's army to come to that understanding psychologically or otherwise. And that thirdly, that uh, uh, I want you to respond to the idea of uh, yes, you refer to. Uh, 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 Africans' uh, rebellion in in terms of, uh, of riots and such, and and I want and I wanted to say that as we speak to the youth, it's us who must incite our children, us, and we cannot incite them by even raising philosophically and intellectually a, a position that says to them, joining the white man's army is a good thing because there are some benefits there. You know, you can go to college, they'll pay for it, and such and such and such. We must adamantly oppose that idea of sending our children, given the idea that they should join the army. We, us, ex-veterans or whatever, we must tell them that. Because we confuse them with a dial, with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, opposing views on that subject. So could you please, ex uh, uh, both of you, respond to those ideas. Was Africans not convinced that they could kill the white man and not be killed themselves, and that they were disciplined even during the enslavement, and that you recognized that they were disciplined and they didn't have to join the military? And number three is uh, uh, the idea of, uh, what was number three? Damn, I forgot. Uh, being disciplined, uh, that psychologically they were instilled with the idea of the absence of fear to be free and to fight for that. Please. Well, you're talking about a whole, talking about 400 years now. I mean, but look, you started from, uh, you started yeah, from our look, enslavement. Okay, I mean, first of all, I, I just mentioned discipline in passing, but everybody's not disciplined the way you describe and everybody's not revolutionary. And the fact that most of the rebellions that took place here were very sharp and did not achieve what the, the, uh, rebellious people wanted. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Nat Turner did something, he killed maybe 60, 65 people. That was short-lived, only a few months. What I said about the military was, for some, it wasn't for me. I said I, I had deferments because I was smart enough to know how to get deferments. Because I was not going to Vietnam, even though I did go to Vietnam, but on my terms. Um, the fear there are black folks still today frightening the white people. Mm -hmm. So, for a, someone to go in the military, someone who say was raised in Georgia or Alabama, and all he knew was sharecropping <coughs> and he knew exploitation, and he got drafted or he volunteered and he went off to Germany or France or Vietnam, 
And he saw what I described, white people in fear. And he saw that he was in a physical and maybe in a, a uh, moral sense was stronger. That's liberating. Mm -hmm. That's what I was talking about. That was liberating. So when these men came home in 1919, because the war ends, the, the uh, armistice is November 11, 1918. Time to get back to America by, by sea is 1919. And that summer called the Red Summer because of all the bloodshed, they fought back. And that's why that woman who did not identify herself to Du Bois, she said, as you understand, I cannot sign my name. Just a southern woman. And she said when she heard that the men in Washington fought back, she was so happy she jumped on the bed and she just beat it, crying and, and shouting at the same time. She said, at last, our men fought back. Which meant they weren't fighting back before. Now my argument was, these men were veterans who came home who knew military prowess and knew that they didn't have to act the way they did before. And that's why we have what is called the new Negro. The old Negro was subservient. The old Negro allowed uh, white supremacy to exist. The new, new Negro said, I'm going to cut your ass right now. That is a different, it was a different persona that came out. Uh, I think part of the thing about Vietnam with the drugs was that the, that the government recognized that this person coming out of Vietnam was not the same kind of person coming out of earlier wars. And so the drugs were fed to these soldiers, the activists, who were joining the various you know, movements at that time. Right. That, that, that was one of the major, major differences with... Uh, black soldiers coming out of Vietnam had, coming out with a higher consciousness, had the option of hooking up with different kinds of militant black organizations throughout the United States. And, and, and that's also the reason why the government created the counterintelligence program, because of that critical mass of young black people who uh, who were defiant of the status quo, and who had, uh, and some of them had military training, and that that made that made made a made a difference. Um, we the the soldiers in 1919 coming back um, would were coming, and, and many of them began to join in. You mentioned the African Blood Brotherhood formation. That formation was a revolutionary formation um, that's, that uh, eventually the leadership wound up in the United Negro Improvement Association. Uh, but I'm sorry, Universal, I keep saying that. Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, Garvey's group. <clears throat> and uh, that, in other words, that there was there were a, a social movement happening when these soldiers came back from uh, World War One and World War Two. <coughs> World War Two, the social movement was just beginning. The so-called civil rights movement was just beginning, and they came back and they were infused in that, and they and they helped push it forward. Also, the Vietnam War, obviously, the civil rights movement slash Black liberation movement was was uh, was was going strong, and come but coming out of the the wars in the Middle East today. Um, we don't, our brothers and sisters are coming back, and we don't have something organized for them to join outside of the spontaneity things that happen around police brutality. Um, and, and, and so we need to organize. It's very difficult work, but it's necessary. We need to organize something that's institutionalizing the revolutionary spirit that, uh, uh, that we've had over, over, the, over the, uh, the centuries. We need to have that, and 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 um, um, there are various ways that we that, that that are coming about where we can approach this. Uh, for example, the uh, reigniting of the reparations movement with the gathering that's coming up in a, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks um, here in New York City mm -hmm. is is one avenue. The Black Lives Matter movement is another, very very important. That, that, that we need to 
uh, link ourselves with and encourage the young folk to do even more development, uh, developmental work in institutionalizing the revolutionary spirit that's embedded in, in, in that movement. Um, the the uh, fight back in public education, uh, as, as Brother Sales pointed out, the whole privatization of public education, forcing the dumbing down of our young people, forcing our young people to go through the school to prison pipeline, resulting in New York City only having 20% uh, of the high school graduates black being able to go into college-ready courses. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a crime. That's, that's educational genocide. Um, th that, that is a movement that we need to build. And, and, and they're, they're, they're connected. The massive gentrification program that's impacting uh, all of New York, all of black New York, is, is something that we need to build a fight back on. And there needs to, and, and there needs to be a link between these. Uh, our young people uh, going into the military turns out objectively in this past 20 years turns out to be an economic draft. An economic draft. They don't need the draft. And uh, as, as, as when we were growing up, they don't need that kind of draft. They got the economic draft. They, they created a situation where you, you know, the military seems to be the only economic alternative for a lot of young black folk. And so that goes back to what I said before. We have an obligation to find ways of developing jobs within our communities and those jobs to help develop the community. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, from what I gather from both of your points, you have two different arguments. I have the same question, but I guess the answer will greatly vary. Basically, I got cut off my opinion altogether to keep under one under it's a minute. Hear you, oh, I'm sorry, let me speak up. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to cut my opinion out of take, this. Take two all, minutes. Take all two together. Minutes. Okay, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. My question as a young young brother, like I'm basically ideally who y'all are talking about, at twenty two. Um I have uh my amongst my peers I have people that are, are not, you wouldn't particularly say they're conscious, but they're thinkers. I'm a thinker, so I attract thinkers. Um, being that, that being the case, my question to both of you is, in your respective arguments, what would be your ploy, or what would you tell me to spread amongst them, you know, whether it be to join the military, what am I telling them, like, what is the strategic plan, or what, is, what am I telling them that I would do, that would convince them to join the military, or to revolutionize and to build our own um, so on and so forth like amongst like uh, you know my peers or whatever like I said I, I have thinkers whether you consider conscious or not it's up to you but um, and also the other half of my peers that not are particularly conscious not particularly thinkers like uh, somebody touched on before like they're a little dumbed down they're closer to what the, like the average black man would be or you know they're you know, in the masses, uh, they, they might be a little conscious on considering what Ferguson and things like that, so whether I have to use something like that or, you know, so on and so forth, but keeping it to the conversation, whether to be in the military or not in the military, what am I telling my peers to light that spark so we can get something done, whether it's inside or outside? But um, that being said, I just, I slipped my opinion in, is that uh, the... The U.S. Army is the strongest army in the world, and has been. It's a superpower army. So, no matter which way we go, whether it's to build our own, right. to revolutionize, right. or to infiltrate and try to make it conditions. I wouldn't say to infiltrate with the means of making it better, but honestly, I feel like we'll have to infiltrate to break it down at some point. Because it's going to have to be dealt with. It's the greatest army in the world, so at some point they're going to use it. But, um... So yeah, that, that's my main question is like, what, what am I telling my, my peers as far as to get something done to, you know, to spread the word, to spark a fire, to, to build something going forward in your respective? Yeah. Well, uh, from my, again, this is the base, so it's sticking to yeah. my role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like for example, my, my uh, nephew, is in the Marine Corps. Because mm -hmm. he, he had problems with you know, education, 
Uh, he was aimless, you know, just drifting. He had no discipline. So he joined the Marine Corps. I, I tried to talk him out of it. I told him the Marines are the first one who's going to combat, right. not the Army. But he, he joined the Marine Corps. He went to Okinawa. Uh, <clears throat> he re-enlisted. <laughs> and, and now he's thinking about joining uh, Highway Patrol, State Police. For him, it was a good, good move because he had no aim in life. He had, he had no options. He, he tried college for a semester, and that didn't work at all. So he had no aim. So if in his case, you know, three or four years was an investment because at least he can get himself together. Now, if someone is already together, then there are other options. And I think one option, see, see college is always an option, but a better option is college plus self-learning. I have a PhD in American history because when I got mine in 1977, they weren't offering one in African American history. But I've taught African American history. I've written books on African American history. I've written encyclopedia entries. I've done all this academic stuff. I never had a course in African American history. I got it from going to the libraries. Because I was disciplined in that, re in that respect to apply myself you know, in the library to learn. And everybody can't do that. So, again, if, if you're just aimless and driftless, then military might be the answer to get you more solid. Um, I had a, I have a nephew who was in that predicament. He was, he was um, on the verge of signing papers to go into the Navy out of Virginia. And my wife and I said, we're not going to have that. Have him come live with us. Leave his mother. Have him come live with us. That's, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation at, at, at this point. You know, have him come live with us. What, what happened was, we asked him, what do you really want to do? What do you like? What do you like to do? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you really wish that you can do? And, and he said, I'd like to take pictures. He said, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. We will find some place where you learn the technique of taking pictures, right? So, um, and, and, and the good thing about New York City is that you have those kinds of resources that you can check out, you know. And, and as a matter of fact, any major urban center, you can have that. And to make a long story short, he is a senior, uh, what they call photographer, he's a cameraman at a, at a, in Philadelphia at a, at a national radio station now senior, about to retire. Um, and he always said, if, if I didn't do that, you know, because he was like, like you said, he was drifting, right, and, and uh, about to get into the bad elements and so, and so forth. But I, I think one, in this, in this period of our weak state as an organized black revolutionary force in this country, <clears throat> work among our young people vis-a-vis -vis the military, it requires one-on-one, one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one, until we're able to have an organization that is able to focus on, you know, getting young people to see um, the military is not the way you can do something else. We can, you know, th 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 there is some, there's always a need for carpenters, there's always a need for plumbers, there's always a need for electricians. <clears throat> there's always a need for people who know how to drive and fix cars and stuff like that. Uh, until we're able to develop a, an, organ, an organizational uh, apparatus to, 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 to institutionalize that, we have to do serious one-on-one -on -one work um, to, to, to stem the tide of this economic draft. Uh, uh, with your friends who are, uh, you say, who, who are thinkers, if they are thinkers, they, are, they have made a political, progressive, move because today in the United States a young black man is not supposed to be a thinker you know I mean coming out of public school right <laughs> you're not you're, that's an accident right you're not supposed to be a thinker uh, so that so they need to understand that they are in a unique position uh, they are not normal these are abnormal brothers and and, and sisters if you have some sisters who are also in your, in your group of thinkers. 
uh, and, and that they should, they should see themselves as that and, and, and encourage even further thinking, right? Thinking, reading, checking out the library, Schomburg, wherever, you know, doing all of those kind of activities um, <clears throat> will be helpful in transforming a generation of young black people who don't have the, the how would you say, the structural wherewithal to, to do the work that we did when we were your age. Right? That, a lot of that stuff has been exorcised out of our community. And, 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 and you, you and I and, and other elders will have to help rebuild that. And, and, and that's, that, that's through formal and informal ways. So one, the work on uh, helping our children not go into the military is a one-on-one -on -one job while we are in, in, in the process of, 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 of rebuilding the black liberation movement so that we have an institutional structure that will, that will take on that, 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 that challenge. I can listen to both of you all day long, <laughs> so I appreciate um, what you are offering to us here. But I have a quick question. Um, this is for you, Dr. Anderson. Um, Dr. Sorrell had um, mentioned a list of, um, or had run off, some rather large and, quite frankly, frightening numbers in terms of the numbers of um, neo-Nazis, I think he said 142,000. No, 142. 142. They may have 142,000 people in the groups. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so it's 142, then 117 racist skinheads. 119. 119? And one Tea Party. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Frank, I've heard larger numbers than that for uh, organized... Uh, uh, neo Nazi and and, and uh, but these are related numbers. These, well, these, these are just from like last month's right. uh, uh, publication from the Southern Plan Watch or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it may be more, but that's that's what they. So these are groups. Yes. The number of groups. They're, they're, they're like groups. They're all loose. So you got you might have clans in Birmingham, Alabama, and you got a clan group in Seattle, and they all they're clans members. They're just like loosely affiliated groups. So. Oh, okay. I'll stick and some are fraternities too. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm going to stick to my question anyway, because in my mind, um, if there are, if, if it is 142,000, in my mind, okay, um, and of those groups, um, how do we combat, or what is the answer to those groups um, when um, you had, you're, what you're saying is that what we need to do is to get the training, educational training, and then jobs and that sort of thing to help to rebuild the revolutionary cause and, and spirit. Um, how do you combat that if, let's say they would, because in terms of now, it's, it's 2015, and I'm thinking these militia groups, they are armed and ready for a race war. So mm -hmm. let's say they come to the middle of the Bronx, you know, as soon as Obama is out of office. Mm -hmm. How do we combat that? Because what you're what you're suggesting and what you're um, stating is the, the job situation and the economic or educational training, those things take time in trying to build up people. What would be your answer for those things, uh, those, those numbers? Because I'm, I'm thinking they're coming tomorrow. Excuse me one second. Sister, I, I just want to tack something onto what she said. Not much, but would you include group, you know, you may not call them neo-Nazis, but would you include groups like Blackwater, and, and, and those, oh, those, wow. sorts of, those, those sorts of things in that, oh, yeah. in that question she oh, asked. Absolutely. absolutely. They're, 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 they're paramilitary forces right. whose leadership is white supremacy. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, that's a good question. And you, you raise us uh, an interesting scenario. If, if they come to the Bronx, right, um, they'll be met with some firepower. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, if, 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 it, if it's that, if it's white supremacists, not the cops, mm. right? <laughs> white supremacists coming into the, the black and Latino community in the Bronx. Um, all those brothers and sisters who got weapons will, will um, many of them will stop the inter 
nascent mm. war <laughs> and confront that obvious enemy. Now, I don't see I don't see that kind of invasion in our community as a problem. I I, I see that as a as as a blessing in disguise because it begins to you know raise the consciousness among our people. You know, especially the young folk who have the weapons say like, no, no, we can't have these crackers come in here. You know, in our community and try to shoot us up. And you know, so so that that that, that kind of confrontation um, is is something that is positive. And I think those who rule understand that. They understand that, right? And 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 you can have a more powerful impact in our community by having the police be the surrogate for the white supremacist organizations. You have white supremacist individuals in the police department, mm. right? And the leadership of the police department, may it be black or brown or white, oftentimes look the other way for a lot of the stuff that they're doing in our community, okay? So that's what we need to challenge. We need to challenge that part that, yes, there are these explicit white supremacist groups out there, but there's also the, the local police departments that are the surrogates or the, the front part of the white supremacist groups, okay? Uh, uh, 142,000 white individuals in 142 uh, white supremacist organizations is our major threat. They're, I mean, they, they, they can wreak havoc, but I think it's the militarized police force right. that's already in our community right. that, that has, uh, in, in, in its mindset, protect and serve capitalism and white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to pose a question. Come on. Okay. I'm going to pose a question, and then I'm going to make a couple of statements, and I would like to respond. What about the concept of different strokes for different folks? And the reason I'm saying that is, in my own family, my uncle, he's deceased now, he was a paratrooper in the Korean War. He jumped out of planes. When he finished the Korean War, he needed an occupation, and somebody helped him to become an air traffic controller. He did that wow. job for about 20 years. He retired, and he actually loved his job. In the Which time when he Which lived one? working as an air traffic controller, he made over six figures. He worked in Washington, D.C. He met Elizabeth Dole. He trained a lot of minorities in, the, in that field, air traffic control. He that owned, means like, he trained a lot houses. of white people. Excuse me? That, that means he trained a lot of white people. Oh. He was well, training he, minorities. He, he trained, well, okay. He trained we black, are the majority. And Hispanic, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> he trained a lot of black and Hispanic males to become air traffic controllers. He loved his occupation. And uh, other relatives I have were in the Peace Corps, uh, in the military. One of them learned uh, procurement. And now there are zillions of jobs with the MTA. They're looking for people that have backgrounds in procurement, mm -hmm. and they can't find them. And my cousin said to me, do you know any black people that are interested in this field? I mean, like, they, it pays over six figures. And a lot of people don't know about these careers. And you can learn this, get this sort of training in the military. My nephew went into the military several years ago against the wishes of my brother and my sister-in-law. They pleaded, they begged, we don't want you to do this. He is so happy. He's been to Korea. He speaks Korean now. He's learning Mandarin Chinese. He's been to Hong Kong. He's learning cybersecurity, all this computer stuff. And headhunters have been calling him. He can get well over six figures when he gets out of the military. So I think, on one hand, we have to consider, OK, there are all these issues that you addressed in terms of the racism, et cetera. But on the other hand, I want to see black men employed. I'm a former teacher. I'm always reading statistics about the high black male unemployment rate. And I fear that by saying, don't do this or don't do that, we're closing off potential career opportunities. My nephew, in particular, when he was in high school, he was always reading books about Horatio Alger and, and military strategy. That was something that he likes. He tried the corporate world. He hated it. He was bored. He was miserable. And he seems like he's really, really happy in the, in the Air Force. So my point is, Maybe instead of just saying, don't do this or don't do that, we have a little bit more, what's the word I want, uh, an open mind. Because 
there are career options that could be valuable. I think the reason we say don't go into the military is because we don't want our, our sons, nieces, uh, nephews, whatever, get killed. When people think military, that's the first thing they think of. Infantry, artillery, they're out there on the field, they're going to get killed. But what about all the opportunities for people that go the officer route, that learn about computers? I mean, now we're worried about Al-Qaeda and they're, you know, hacking into computers. What about getting those kinds of skills in the military so when you get out, you have a skill that's viable that people are willing to pay for and will give you a great career? That demands. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> That, that, was, that was the last question, though. Okay. Right. There's one more. There's one more. Uh, one more. Oh, okay. But you you want to you want to. Uh, okay. Um, your story are are are, are anecdotal, right? It it, it doesn't uh, reveal the real deal in, in in the military. Most. Most, the yeah. vast majority, you have to, you, you heard the stats. Oh, yeah, okay. Right? Uh, and, 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 and secondly, most, well, you know, most black people who join the military do not have that opportunity. Oftentimes they are recruited by saying, you know, we'll, you know you'll be able to go to college while you're in the military. Mm -hmm. And most of the time that does not happen. Okay? That's, that's the trick. And then those who do go can't do what they want to do. All right? Mm -hmm. And then if they came out with a skill, it's very difficult for, for them to find their, their uh, find jobs. I mean, it's, it's, it's data, it's the statistics will show you that. You, what happened in your family is the exception to the rule. The exception to the rule. Okay. Plus, what happened in your family uh, especially with the, the relatives of, of 20 and 25 years ago, cannot happen now. It's a different kind of military uh, structure. In, in, it, it, it just won't happen. You, you, have, you have young brothers who want to go into the cyber security kind of stuff in the military. Very few black men or women are in that position. Very, very few. Less than three percent of the cyber folk, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are black. Okay, and why? Because of a number of factors. One is the educational background, right? And they, and and, and you, you might have the skills, the raw skills for doing it uh, at home or at uh, you know video arcades or wherever. But if you don't have that academic line. They're not going to take you in. In other words, if you, if your high school didn't have the, uh, an aspect of, of computer science and stuff like that, they're not going to take you in. Okay, uh, and, and so you, you, it, it's a challenge. Um, the myth that you can go into the military <clears throat> and get a skill or get education is just that—a myth, especially. <clears throat> In 2015, you know, as 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 Brother Sale says, as this military is becoming more centralized and more uh, technologically centered, that the troops will just be what the old military term grunts, mm. right? And that and that and that the the, the cyber the, and, and high technician folk will be a small group. Of mainly white men and women, with a handful of blacks in that in that upper echelon of the of the technolized technolized uh, U.S. military. So again, I stress: child wants to go into the military, say no to that. Find an alternative route for them, and there are alternatives. You have to work hard at it. You you know you struggle with it. And 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 and, and uh, you, you, we'll be able to find ways. There, there are ways of networking to, to to get that child. Anything else but the military. Yes. All right. Wait. Just one.
tried to do some things to, to make people know there was a debate. Because some people just want to say, no, no, absolutely. And, and, and I think never has a patient come to me or one of my kids or other, and I tell them go into the military. They say, no, 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 no. I was there with Dr. S uh, Dr. Um, Sorrell, only I was in a different capacity uh, during the Tet Offensive. I was, I, I was in Vietnam, and I learned no. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know the answer for real, no. But on the other hand, when I looked, I didn't think it was an accident that, do you remember that picture of those brothers coming out of Cornell? Yeah. Okay, when they took over, okay. And well, it's the, Hall, I was there. All right. <laughs> when the brother, did, you know Eric, did you know Eric Evans? No. Eric Evans is the brother of that bandolier. Yeah. Do you know he was a transfer student from West Point? <laughs> so it's not an accident that he's a transfer student from West Point. And I don't think that it's even an accident that Sonny Carson was who Sonny Carson was. I don't think it's an accident. I know it's not an accident that the Deacons for Defense and Justice, I mean, they've said, oh, they, at least in the movie they say it, but also in the biographies they say it, it did help them to learn what they could do. But I don't say go into do you know, I don't say to go into do it, but I'll say this, though. There's always going to be young people that's going to go in. You know, there was no reason for me to go in. Everybody told me don't go in, but I went in anyway. There's always going to be young people to do this. And the, the things that the United States has, you can't even know if you don't go certain places. Mm -hmm. The things they have at communications, if you don't go to the cage, used to be in Fort Gordon, Georgia, you're not going to know. Uh, things that happen on a nuclear submarine, you're not going to know. Mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 I respectfully, you know, uh, accept what Brother Sam says is you have to be organized before you do this, but it, it's a real question. It's not, this, it was a real debate today, and I think that our speakers gave us a lot of information, but I wanted you to know the process. Well, what, was, what, what, what were we thinking about? What do we think needs to be talked about? Uh, if it's 100, 142 groups, I wish I could share Brother Sam's optimism in terms of what the response would be. Because I think mm -hmm. down in New Orleans during Katrina, hello, you got to see right. uh, that it, 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 you know, it's it's not, <laughs> you know, it, it, and and I think Bosnia, your neighbors will kill you if they have the weapons and you don't. You can have the will, but if you ain't got the weapons, and if you got the weapons, you probably ain't got the bullets. The Army Navy store is not going to sell you enough to fight the these groups. These groups, anybody see Doomsday Preppers and these yes. things? Okay, there's people, thousands of people, man, they're, 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 not only are they saving bullets and food, they're making the bullets. They got these things to make, thousands and thousands of bullets. Uh, the, the purpose of today's debate really was to make us think about a lot of issues, and fortunately, our speakers, I could never have thought of the stuff that Dr. Sorrell came up with. You know, I was wondering how he was going to do this, but to take that historical thing, that, wasn't that wonderful? Give him another one. <laughs> But Brother Sam was up to the task, you know what I mean? He wasn't equivocal in what he said in terms of what we have to tell our young people. So we're just so blessed that we have all of this wealth in our community uh, of people that have information. So on the 12th, we're going to have another great debate. Uh, we're going to have a debate about one person whose sons were veterans, that's Frederick Douglass, and one person who was himself, oh, this is one that I one of the things that got my interest was, I think it was within the past year, I realized something. It's like, you ever have some information, but the information just didn't click in your head what that meant. I've been seeing a lot of times that Harriet Tubman, there were some reports from some people that she was supposed to be at Harper's Ferry. There was a point mm -hmm. that she said she yeah. was sick, that's why she wasn't there. That was another thing. There were other things that said she recruited people to go to Harper's Ferry, blah, blah, blah. And then it hit me, I said, wait a minute. When I read about how she joined the Union Army right away, it was clear. She was neither for the Union <laughs> or against the Union. She was for liberation of black people. So she was willing to pick up arms against the United States, just really a matter of a couple of years before she's there in the Army. And people like um, Martin Delaney, they weren't in the Army out of patriotism. They were in the Army specifically to fight to uh, liberate black people. So uh, it's a question that hasn't only had to be answered 
during our generation, you know, what, do you pick up arms against the United States? She would pick up arms against the United States when that was going to get it, and she picked up arms for the United States when that was going to get it. So uh, I think we had a, a, a real debate, and uh, I wanted to jump in there, obviously, in the fact that I'm taking five or ten minutes afterwards, but, but I, I did want to jump in there. But this Blackwater thing, i got to find a way we can talk about this, because I don't think people, how many people, is there any, I'll bet you this, some, is there anybody in here who don't know what I'm talking about when I say Blackwater? You see that? See that? I know that. They got another name now. They, yeah, they changed it. They did. They did. I, I can't remember the new name. It's like about two or three letters now, right? Something, something short. Yes. But they're not yes. the only one. They got multiple groups of paramilitary groups. These are groups, these are uh, what, what do you call contractors for the military, for the United States military. And in this role of contractor, they have been able to hide how many forces are in some of these wars mm -hmm. by having civilians who are over there uh, doing the functions that military people used to do. But Formal they don't only people. do, excuse me? Former military people. A lot, a lot of them are, a lot of them are former military people. Boy, you're going to start me on something else. I had a, <laughs> one time I had a question, you know, like thinking about the creator. You know, the creator, okay, if, if, if there's a creator who's in charge of everything and all of it, why, because my field, I'm a psychiatrist, is why would you make people that are psychotic? No, I'm not playing now. So you can have psychiatrists. <laughs> so I can have a job. That's <laughs> right. No, no. But what happened was is that I got a client who came in, and he told me something that I could never possibly <clears throat> learn if he was not psychotic. And I said, you know, these people are so that there will be no secrets in the world. Because as long as you got people that you know, that lose uh, the ability to uh, understand what's real and what's not real. And what he did, this, I'm coming back to Blackwater. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to lose any associate. I'm just circumstantial. Um, he told me about something that I was reading in the City Sun, which was Moranos. Okay? But he didn't have that word even. He just described the behavior of his father who was in, there was some place in South America. He was here, he was in a gang in the South Bronx. He was ostensibly a Latino, but in actuality, he was the descendant of secretly practicing Jews. His father was a secretly practicing Jew. Now that concept, you know, if you don't know about that, there's plenty of places to read about it. These are people who are either the descendants of people who when the Jews were expelled from places like Spain and Portugal, or, you know, when somebody comes to you and says, we're going to kill you if you, if you say you're a Jew. You say, I'm not a Jew, right? Or, you know, dude, if you say, some people say I'm Christian. Some people, of course, go get eaten by the lions and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of people will change what they say they are. You come up to them with that kind of an offer. So I realized that. Now, I was hearing about Blackwater, but I just didn't know what the clients were saying to me. I had patients. The patient was telling me about this guy. He wouldn't know Lausanne, Switzerland from, uh, you know, the names of the... He, he, he'd be more likely to know the names of the moons around Jupiter than to know Lausanne, Switzerland. What a patient told me was, was that some people had hired him to go pretend he was a, 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 a medical student in Lausanne, Switzerland. And then they took him and they moved him to a place in South America where they gave him a wife. You understand what I'm saying? They gave him a woman who was his wife. And his purpose down there was to poison a well or some, you know, some source of It was crazy. It was, you know, it was crazy, but he was telling me this. But the only thing that made me pay attention was I knew there was a medical school in Lausanne, Switzerland. He said, yeah, they sent me to Lausanne, Switzerland. <laughs> this got to be real. Where would he get this name from? And then I heard another brother who, he, his was in and out. You know, like when you hear a drunk person, they're saying this, that, and a third, and you can hardly understand. And he was talking about being taken to Arizona and being, you know, after he got out of the military and all this kind of stuff. And it was later when I learned about Blackwood, I said, this guy was talking about one of those things. He was telling me that a group, that he was hired to be a soldier after he had gotten out of the military. But it wasn't making sense at that time what he was telling me. So I think this thing with Blackwater and those types of groups, we got to find some kind of way to stimulate the discussion about that. 
we got to have some debate in which we stimulate the discussion about this. Because, I mean, these, now this, this group, when you talk about thousands, we're talking about thousands of members. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres of property, I think, down in North Carolina. We're talking about planes, tanks, and these people are not the United States Army. Headquartered in Dubai, I think it is. They, 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 I mean, they're all over. But, I mean, they had a, I'm saying they had a, a they, they have bases. Yeah. So they had a base down in North Carolina. Pennsylvania. Okay. So, you know, I appreciate heart. Well, they come, we're going to take them. You're not. <laughs> You're not. I mean, a, a modern squad, a modern platoon of men could take Lennox Terrace. There'd be nothing that could, they could do. Nothing. A squad. Nothing. You mean platoon. I just said, so I said a platoon. I changed it. I started to say a squad. A squad. I'm not sure about a squad. I changed it to a platoon. <laughs> I did change it. You know, but I mean, does it make a difference? They got many platoons, so it, they could put two if they needed. Uh, we and have to really, uh, this, 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 you know, uh, I think that some of the dogmatism we have about certain things are given to our black revolutionaries because whites are afraid of race war. So they put us in a position where, you know, they don't have to worry about us in that. I, 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 I think I, uh, you, you, you and your family, you circulated an article I wrote about. How many people remember Hassan uh, uh, Akbar? And you remember Hassan Akbar? I'll tell you his other name. His other name was Fidel Cools. You remember? He was a soldier in Kuwait who, <laughs> I mean, he, he shot his, he was a sergeant. And he mowed down his fellow soldiers, he killed the officers and whatnot. He was very deadly in the stuff he did. And um, uh, they were very afraid of that. He's not dead yet, but they have, they've sentenced him to death, but he, he's, not, uh, he, he's, he's not dead yet. And one of the things that struck me was the absence of these people that's against the death penalty and stuff saying anything about this guy. The absence of people even talking about him and what it was that he did. Because I mean, if you say that, that, that an imperialist uh, uh, American, then why wouldn't you support this guy? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you make sure that they don't do certain things to him? You know, and I'm not just talking about killing them. You know, just do certain things to him. Especially when you look and you see his middle name is Fidel. Somebody in his family, he was thinking something. Unless it's just an accident, <laughs> right? So at any rate. Uh, brothers and sisters, thank you for one, your one uh, question. Uh, one, one, everybody, but, uh, <laughs> we can socialize for a few minutes, but in about 20 minutes, if uh, if you're not finished, you don't have to go home. Is black?